Welcome. I am Erin Schneider. I'm with the North Central SARE program, and I also farm in Wisconsin. I'm excited to be here with you all today, and doubly so to have Lauren McAllister with Three Flock Farm join us for our um, this edition of Farming Matters, which is a SARE video program that just really helps amplify and celebrate um, farmer rancher grantees, share what they learned about their project and what they would offer to other farmers. And I could not be here or do this without the technical support from our communication specialist, Marie Flanagan. Hey, Marie. Hi. <laughs> Hi. And yeah, I guess without further ado, um, I am going to toss it over to Lauren. To, and he, she is here to tell us about her farm and you know how and why she became interested in her SARE project. So Lauren, welcome. Hi, everyone. Like Erin said, I'm Laura McAllister. I'm thrilled to share with you how this process has unfolded. And really something that I've learned from the very beginning is that SARE is really supportive. So I went into the SARE grant project with privilege. I've written grants before. I've been awarded grants before. Your girl was an English major. Okay, not a problem. So that wasn't what scared me. It was really just the scientific method. I really wanted to produce something sound, reliable, right? valid, all those good answers. So I'll start off by saying Sarah did a great job of giving me all the tools, being transparent about the projects and their budgets that helped me be successful in my grant application. So I'm one of two people. My husband and I, Brett, we run Three Flat Farm in Ellisville, Indiana. We have 25 acres that we steward. Not enough, but definitely closer to our goal. We're interested in shifting our small farm into a land trust so that we can continue land liberation for Black and Indigenous communities. I partner heavily with the People Cooperative Market. And from there, I sell all these mushrooms that came out of my no waste uh, project. So thinking about circular economies, that's what comes out of a cooperative mindset. And so when I thought about how many coffee roasters and brewers we have, a lot, not a little, and how much small business economy was built on fees, right? So if they're paying tons and tons of fees, they make clothes. And so I was trying to figure out how we could get those nutrient dense substrates out of the landfill. And interesting mostly because A, I was drinking a lot of coffee at the time, and B, I saw how it could benefit my farm just growing the coffee out there. My husband's grandmother had Alzheimer's, and so dementia patients really benefit from lion's mane mushroom cultivation, right? You're putting it together. So I have all this extra, which capitalism produces intentionally, excess is what will happen. And I'm thinking, how do I encourage my local economy, create something that can be fed to vulnerable communities? That's what People's Market does in and of itself. And that can bolster my farm. Let's be honest. I want to be able to produce a product that has a high yield, high profit margin. So I started asking questions from my coffee roasters, my friends who brew, grain, brew um, beer. And had, what do they do with all this grain? So I Googled it. And it was really clear that this was a question a lot of people were having, but it wasn't framed with a small farmer in mind. So then I came to my question. Could a small farmer benefit from building community by offering a way to relieve the fees coming from trash disposal and to create a product that could serve vulnerable populations, especially in Indiana, which has one of the highest rates of food insecurity. Super exciting question because it required me to ask, right? I didn't know, I really didn't know. I was just, maybe it would work. And I have tons of people who use the composting method where they put in coffee grounds, but they don't know why, you know? And then I have tons of friends who are using, in landscaping specifically, who are using the brewer's grain, the spent grain, but they don't know why it works. So that became part of the question. What could we use so that mushrooms could grow and actually help soil remediation? There are, in Indiana, if you don't know, clay is king. All the soil has clay. <laughs> full of clay. You could literally dig down, throw some water, and make a pinch pot. So it was a great question to ask, how can I put back in the knowledge I have about mycology with using this waste product that's coming out of our small town? Bloomington is really close, and so there's already farmers who sell there. 
there are already farmers who have relationships there. And it's a big town for those of us who live out in the sticks. I knew it was possible because we had a farmer's market. I knew that I could build relationships because I work with People's Cooperative Market and that is our essential goal to build more relationships in our food system to liberate food. And I knew that I would have a market to sell because those roasters then got to go on Instagram. What did they say? We grew our own mushrooms for our coffee, right? So it benefited them from the beginning. This is a value added product and it gave them a line into the farmer's market that wasn't so price heavy. Mushrooms are pretty cheap and they have a long last, especially if you're making vegan products. We've become a big enough town that vegan is a real need. And so people often do vegan, vegetarian, and meat products here. And just speaking ethically, as a sheep rancher, we cultivate the meat. And so it was awesome for our farm to have a product that we could offer that wasn't meat-based. So I'm excited, right? Coffee roasters are like, let's do this. My friends who brew at home, okay. And then I started sending out this survey of like, what does that really mean? Does anybody even want to do this? Before I even found this their application, I'm just asking this question. And so people keep telling me, you know, you should get research funding about this. I bet there's funding that you could find. Sure, right? Google. Someone tells me that Sarah is actually an national organization. So it wasn't just, I was thinking it was just in Indiana or just in the Midwest. And that's what I mean. Getting on and just being able to search the word mushroom cultivation, get on and searching circular economy and just putting those few keywords into the projects. Let me know that this was something people were interested in, but not necessarily connecting the way that I was. So I'm excited about that. Being able to use the website whenever I needed to, so that I could get the information necessary to begin to build this project grant application. Again, I'm coming from a privileged point, so I knew this was going to be a few weeks, but really the application wasn't that hard. So that was also a pleasant surprise. So then I find the other projects and I'm like, oh, I can do this. Then I find the application, I'm like, wow, this is something I can accomplish with a lot of broad strokes and be able to really narrow down and ask a specific question. I didn't want to find out if all roasters, right? wanted to participate are all brewers, but just ones in my community because they're the ones that are going to continue to pay higher trash disposal fees. So I'm finding projects, I'm looking at their budgets, I'm understanding what a midline application looks like. I'm not asking for too much or too little. And then I'm starting to see a trend that all of these farmers, ranchers are really trying to share important information, right? So it's not, again, broad strokes. It became really specific. I saw one about sweet potatoes. I saw one about cleaning with hydrogen peroxide. Those helped me articulate the scope of my project. I knew I needed a research assistant so that I could keep track of these sort of 0 .0, 0 0.01 measurements. And I knew that I was gonna have to dive deep into home sterilization. So I got some resources from those project ideas, including a Paul Stamen's book, which gave me the format of how to think about growing mushrooms, not just on log. I'm a huge fan of growing mushrooms. So once I started doing some evidence-based research on how a lot of people were doing it in mass production, I was discouraged. So much plastic, so much plastic. I couldn't understand it. I didn't understand why we were doing such a good job of creating mushrooms and then growing them in plastic. So then I found unicorn bags. Then I'm like, oh, this narrows my project, right? Because I can use a unicorn bag without the fear of waste, creating more waste with my project to measure against what I have at home. So I'm on a farm, we have fall jars. I drink coffee every day. So a French press, this is as simple as I got. I was like, I don't want to make this hard. If somebody could do this as much as I do, which is too much, right? Multiple cups of coffee a day, multiple dumpings of these grounds then the amateur could have an entry point into mycology. Even saying that I'm a mycologist comes from a simple process of making my coffee in the morning, dumping it, and then getting the right resource. A substrate, knowledge, along with the inoculation. Again, I was thinking this would be too technical, too over my head. I would have to have a special lab. Okay, I wanted the white coats. But besides that, I was not gonna be able to afford a special lab with the right venting and all that. What would happen if I just let it go? So I went to a local 
um, hydroponics and they were right at the timing hydroponics just started really giving mass production an opportunity for any mushroom growers they were able to buy in bulk and then resell into the public so i was able to get syringes full of oyster shiitake and lion's mane for like seven dollars so it's, so it's like bringing down the cost of what this project would be creating my budget from there was easy because I had a relationship with the hydroponics, I had a relationship with the coffee grounds, and I knew that I'd get all of these parts free. Once I nailed down the budget, I understood who my stakeholders were and what I was gonna ask them, I submitted the application. Then I found out I could get half the funding ahead of time because I'm a farmer of color. And so that shifted it completely. I got so thrilled, I was like, this is incredible. And there are plenty of times where I had questions, but the website really gave me 90% of the answers. When I think about growing mushrooms for community-based health, that's where lion's mane come in. But when I think about oyster mushrooms, that was just so that our farm could profit. I'm a huge proponent of Soul Fire Farms SARE manual, right? A great way to incorporate low-income or socially vulnerable populations into the food system. So I started asking those questions in that ceremony. I was just like, I'm going to format it this way so that it's easy to read. And I noticed that the worksheets and the documents were approachable. I could use simple language and that I could just draw down on numbers and give a clear indicator to my fellow farmers that even if you don't get a flush from your mushrooms, you can still use the mushroom compost as a way to help soil remediation. So I, I guess I'm, there's a couple of threads in here I'm really curious about. Um, what did you learn that you really think is super important um, for other growers who wanted to do or try something similar? I love that question because I think it is a liberatory question, right? So how can I expand from this project? And what happens is that I got more visibility as a farmer, right? I had something to offer. I came to restaurants coffee grinders, coffee roasters, and coffee shops, brewers, home, and, you know, ones who run bars. And I had something to offer that wasn't just food from the beginning. It was a relationship. I'm going to come and take your waste, make something out of it, and then see how it fits and in, integrates into their practice. I'm a huge advocate of local food. I believe that food should be hyper-local. It shouldn't be more than a few miles away from where you are. And that's kind of a natural occurrence once you start seeing that you actually knew your brewer, this guy's like your friend's cousin's wife. You know, like it all started connecting in a way that made more sense for them also, right? To just reach out to farmers. So I saw other coffee roasters that I wasn't picking up from anymore getting relationships with farmers. I saw more farmers growing more mushrooms. And then I started seeing bulk purchases from restaurants from local farmers, not just the, the mushrooms, right? So now they've built this relationship and it's expanding into seasonal food and specialty items, value added items that maybe farmers don't get to have in bulk purchases. In part, because I think I was talking about this their manual funding. I was like, this is a question that I got money to answer. Mm -hmm. Right. It gave a legitimacy to the work. And I think it really gave creditation to my farm for someone to say, well, she's just looking for how to help us. I overheard mm -hmm. someone saying that about my project. And so it's just interesting how that can come out of it. And then talking to farmers about mushrooms as a profitable margin. Mm -hmm. Right. That really surprised me. They're like, we had no idea. I was like, you can grow so much. 350 pounds of coffee grounds every week from every roaster that's a lot that's an enormous <laughs> amount that's not even the brewer's brain right which is tons and tons and tons compared to a big trash bag so I think the big things that came out of it was just new relationships not just mine but in my community a real resource and mutual aid understanding about how helping local farms help the economy and just an overall feeling like satisfaction that the product was good, right? I didn't have any failure with the mushrooms in either substrate. Where, what else do you, would you love to share? What's it, anything that feels uh, unsaid in your heart that you want to offer up to other farmers out there? I love that question, um, especially with the theme. You know, I'm excited that Sarah is so transparent. And I would like my episode to be hashtag 
Black Farms Matter, Black Farming Matters, <laughs> um, because it really, it gave me a lot of investment. Mm-hmm. Paying somebody ahead of time for work mm-hmm. is an investment that I cannot underestimate. I'm battling, I'm wrestling people mm-hmm. right now for grant money when they could just give me half a front. It's something I say in a lot of, I'm like, well, Sarah trusted me. Mm-hmm. Sarah invested in what I had, you know, so it's really significant to Black farmers to get the upfront investment to say that we believe in what you're doing and the proof is already there. The credentials are already there, not to be questioned. Can you do this? Are you good at it? Will you manage? That wasn't in your application process, right? I didn't feel like that was really at the heart of it. There was an assumption that we brought wisdom as a farmer to the project. And that's rare. So I would say lean into that. We definitely consider at 3 Block Farm, this is a privilege. It's something that we inherited in terms of our wisdom from our parents, our great grandparents. And so knowing that that wisdom was honored, even in the process, the application is straightforward, the budget coming halfway early, and then knowing that I would have opportunities like this to talk about my work really shifted my trust in Sarah as an organization.